Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. And welcome to Invest Africa. I'm Nozi Pombanjwa. We're coming to you from Santon, Johannesburg, where we're plugging in to a conversation on financial inclusion on the African continent. And the question that we're asking is, how much have African governments and the private sector done to ensure that financial products and services are filtering through to the poor? Join me as I kick off this conversation with the United Nations Capital Development Fund. Inclusive finance, uh, it's quite a big term. Just give us a sense of what exactly we're talking about here. Well, if we were to, de to describe inclusive finance, I would say it's really the ability to provide a variety of financial services mm -hmm. through a, a variety of financial service provider in an ecosystem which is conducive to increasing access and usage of financial services. It goes beyond microfinance. I yeah. mean, it talks about... Uh, you know, a broader acception, a broader understanding of what financial services are, including payments, uh, of course, insurance, uh, remittances, uh, mm. credit savings. And it's also referred to the conducive environment, which is enabling financial inclusion. So we're talking about an ecosystem here that goes beyond microfinance. Give us the play uh, on the global space. What are the big trends that we are seeing around inclusive finance? Well, what we have seen is the emergence of new trends and new forces. For mm. example, the power of data and digital platform has revolutionized the ability to provide universal access. Mm -hmm. I think what we are seeing as well is a different uh, nature of engagement and stakeholder process in countries. Mm. It's no longer you know, a discussion with the Ministry of Finance and Central Bank. What yeah. we realize is you have a much larger number of uh, players and, uh, and partners on the government side which have a direct state on financial mm. inclusion. Telecom ministries, mm. you know, for the mobile money, uh, social, um, uh, social affairs ministries for how to make social payment more effective. So it's a, what we see emerging is a, is a broader conversation at country level mm -hmm. and a broader engagement you know, to really push uh, these drivers of financial inclusion. So the engagement uh, sounds like it's certainly broader, but let's bring Africa into this context. Is there a universal performance across all markets or is there particular challenges and opportunities that are coming out of the African context? But I think you know Africa has been really interesting because it has seen it has been at the forefront of the digital finance revolution mm. uh, as a whole. Um, I think what we see, however, is a very contrasted you know situation across countries, and also I would say for all of us a challenge to really understand better uh, you know the client side, mm -hmm. the customer story, and what we have been uh, you know trying to work on and to do, and I can come back to that later. It's the purpose of my being here. Yes, is really you know reflect on how we are learning more about customer needs, how they access and use financial services, and how that insight can really drive better policies mm. and, and smarter delivery channels and, and offering of financial services. Mm. So a lot to be done still. And that's really interesting because from what you're saying, there's almost a, a sense that there are some challenges in the value chain that need to be addressed to ensure that what the consumer wants is also what the service providers yeah. are putting out to the market. So what are the biggest lessons uh, that have emanated from some of the conversations that you've had here over the last couple of days? I think the major lessons for me is like you, you need to bridge the gap mm. between what financial service of providers know and you know, what client needs. Mm. And you know, we are trying to bridge that gap with the work we are doing. Uh, mm. And again, we, we can come back to that later, but really trying to use the data to better inform uh, a better understanding of market segmentation on one side, but also the variety of needs and usage uh, from the client side on financial services. And when you bridge that gap, suddenly you open market opportunities. It appears that there are a number of initiatives underway to bring financial products and services to the poor. But once the gap has been bridged, do financial markets work for the poor? Yes, it does. From the data that we've collected and from empirical evidence that has been done not only by us, but by the World Bank, by SIGAP, by UNCDF, by other international organizations, we can see that 
financial markets do work for the poor, especially when you look at financial diaries. Mm -hmm. In fact, Finmark Trust together with uh, the Ford Foundation, we did the first financial diary covering South Africa, uh, India, and uh, Pakistan, I think. Mm -hmm. And we could see that it's very interesting how the poor manage their finances. Perhaps they manage it better than mm -hmm. even us, because mm -hmm. for them, if they don't have money in the afternoon to buy food to put on the table, then their kids will have to forego mm. that evening meal. So therefore, they've got to manage their finance very well. And you give, when you give them more opportunity by making financial markets accessible to them, then they can improve their livelihood. Mm. I think that's very important. Mm. Mm. I mean, when we talk about uh, microfinance in particular, everybody gravitates to the Grameen Bank and the, um, the amazing story that was. But it's been quite some time uh, since then. What are the major developments that have taken place in the financial market space that, that have allowed for uh, the poor to more easily and more readily be able to access financial services and products? First of all, is understanding what are the needs of the poor. I think there was this sort of uh, barrier between the financial service providers and the poor because of lack of understanding. That's why through the FinScope service, which Finmark mm. Trust does in many countries, now we've covered about 23 countries mm. within SADC and outside SADC and Asia, we are able to provide information to the financial service providers mm -hmm. so that they can adapt their products to the needs right. of the pe poor people, especially the people at the bottom of the pyramid. And then also for policymakers yeah. to use that data, that evidence-based information to change policies. Mm. And for regulators also to be able to look at regulations. So as Finmark Trust, we are able to influence certain decision making yes. at the level of the financial service providers, at the level of policy makers, and at the level of regulators also, which is very important to get the right products to the poor people. Let's talk about two of those three players, uh, the, the policy makers and the private sector. One, how would you assess the, uh, the success rate around influencing policy to date on the African continent? And maybe as a second part of that question, what has been the appetite of the private sector to serve the poor? Well, let me start with the last question, mm -hmm. the appetite of the private sector to serve the poor. Wherever there is profit, where they can see that, you know, they can adapt the business model to make a little bit of more profit, and also to serve the underserved, mm. I think they will go into that. And our experience has been that, you know, the financial service providers, especially the banks, have developed new products mm -hmm. for the poor, and also they've changed their way of doing things. For, for example, agency banking. Yes. Especially in South Africa and in other SADC countries, are becoming more prominent because they know that bricks and mortar now will no longer work. They will have to get nearer to the people because one of the factors inhibiting access to financial services is lack of proximity mm. to those financial services. Well, people have got to walk a long distance to go to a bank or an ATM. But now with this issue of agency banking, the facility comes nearer to the door mm. of the poor people. Many, very often we ask ourselves, but what, why do the poor people, they prefer to go to the money lender yes. than going to the bank to get money? And through our map, you know, by doing segmentation, doing analysis and talking to people through focus groups, we've seen that, you know, because the money lender is part of that community, is at the doorstep of the clients. So he's able to talk the language mm. and very near to them. So for them, getting money even at the higher rate of interest doesn't matter. And on the policies, the ability to influence policy, are we seeing policy responding oh. to these developments? Oh yes, oh yes. For instance, you know, in the case of South Africa, the last year in July, there was this exemption on low level remittances, which the Minister of Finance signed. So it's as a result of our work to tell them, look, if the policies are restrictive for low-level remittances. What will happen? 
people will go through the informal channel and you will not have information on them. In fact, out of the 3.1 million migrant workers that we've got in South Africa today, they remit about 11 billion rand every year. And 68% of it, they go informally. Why? Because of KYC, know your client, which is very restrictive. And we've been working on that to tell the policymakers, look, you've got to be more flexible so that you can know who are the people remitting and to facilitate that remittance also. So as a final question, the regulatory environment, would you say that it's proactively ahead in terms of trying to find uh, conducive regulations for, for governing the sector or is the regulatory environment playing catch up to the developments in the space? I think it's both. They are playing catch up in many cases. Mm. And you know, the regulators, they're very prudent. And why they're prudent? Because they have They've got so many uh, international conventions to abide to, like the banks, for instance, they've got Basel III coming now. And at the same time, the issue of terrorism mm. is a constraining factor for them to open up very fast because they've got to make sure that they've got the strike a balance between opening up and also make sure that you know, there is enough information on those people who are remitting money. So, that's why you know there is a degree of prudence on the part mm. of regulators it comes but rather slowly you've got to convince them really with arguments advocacy keep knocking at their door it's like policymakers mm. also mm. you've got to do advocacy you've got to be close to them that's why as Finnmark Trust we've got this proximity approach mm. in all the countries that we work in so that you know our people our our consultants they are very near to the policymakers so that you know they can keep giving them information, feeding them with the right type of evidence-based information for them to take the right decision. Let's take a short break and when we come back, let's get into the country insights around financial inclusion on the African continent. Welcome back to Invest Africa. If you've just joined us, we're plugging into a conversation on financial inclusion in the African continent. And the question that we're interrogating is, to what extent have policymakers, the private sector and regulators come to the party to ensure that financial markets, services and products are speaking to the needs of the poor? For the investor uh, watching this particular show and looking for an investment opportunity around financial inclusion, what kind of incentives are government put, governments putting on the ground to say, as a private sector player, you can plow your dollars in the sector? I must say, um, having looked at the program, the program now runs in about 15 countries, um, where government has intervened, um, and we see that particularly in Asia and has not come out very strongly in Africa, mm. um, particularly around agricultural fi uh, funding. Um, in Thailand, there's uh, the village fund savings, um, and that has pushed financial inclusion and alleviated a lot of poverty and risk smoothing for farmers in, fi in, in um, Thailand. In Myanmar, one of the biggest drivers of financial inclusion has been the Myanmar Agricultural Development Bank. Mm. Through the provision of credit mm. um, for farmers, and they've been able to then uh, manage their risks in, in their lives, make them more resilient. Um, we haven't seen as much of that in Africa. And one of the big questions coming out of our program, looking at the data coming from consumers, is um, risk smoothing mechanisms, building greater resilience. Um, and the, the questions coming out is, is the role of public, public policy or public-based lending. Mm -hmm. Um, but the other thing that I think that has been particularly interesting is the low levels of insurance. Right. The insurance market has not taken off. It is not targeting the bottom of the pyramid. Um, and looking at the data, my gut feel is the, the level of insurance products is just not suited How for that market. How do we market. get them there? How do we get the insurers on the ground and uh, concerned around the smallholder farmer who's at the bottom of, of that agricultural value chain? Um, to be brutally honest, we've struggled. The bottom of the pyramid is a difficult market. Mm. Um, the, the, the business models are difficult. The revenue models and how they function is very, very difficult. But having said that, they're a dynamic market and they're a functioning market. And part of what um, this program, program does, over and above the policy and regulatory aspects and the ecosystem building, um, we use a lot, of, a lot of the data to identify providers, to look at 
innovative new ways to build products and services yeah. that are going to be able to service the bottom of the pyramid. Mm. Um, so we're going into the DRC, um, partnering with a bank partner, bringing in innovation experts who will be living in communities um, to try and unpack and build and understand how do these agricultural communities yeah. live? What is the financial products that they need? Is it insurance? Is it savings? Is it credit? Is it a combination of, of all of them? that can then lock into and match their income mm. um, so that the products that is served by the market matches their daily lifestyles and not something that we're pushing down. So a key component is the innovation component right. and in trying to figure out how can we make these markets function. And I think that naturally flows into the issues around technology and whether this in itself is an investment opportunity. How do we create incentives uh, for investors who are interested in bringing the technology that might solve some of these uh, bottom of the pyramid issues, uh, willing and wanting to play in the space? I, I like the concept of, an in of incentives to encourage investment. Yeah. We've struggled, it's not an area that we've really looked in, mm. um, but part of the program is around, um, a key component of, is around doing and learning by doing. Um, so a lot of the innovations, a lot of the small conceptual tests that we're doing on the ground is around figuring out what works and what are the policy and regulatory incentives. So we're hoping that a lot of the innovation type of stuff that we're doing will give us the answers around what are the policy and regulatory mechanisms, mm. what are the levers and which government departments should these incentive structures right. fit in and what should they be. And speaking about governments, one would also assume that the whole issue around uh, financial inclusion almost sits around rural governance and traditional affairs. Is this the right place or should we be rethinking where we position financial inclusion in the government agenda so that it receives more prominence and it receives more uh, or a bigger portion of the fiscal purse? Interesting question. We've now run, the program's running in 15 countries. We're yeah. about in implementation of the program in probably seven or eight countries. And we're at that space now where we have gathered enough data to, and we're starting to see that financial inclusion is quite a central component of people's lives. And should, in f because it's so central to healthcare, to education and to poverty alleviation, um, we're starting to realize that it possibly needs a rethink about where it sits. Yeah and how the different interactions between different government departments. Mm. So say for instance, the departments of communications and how they regulate technology right. and the pricing of the access to technology services. Um, data services, data services is gonna become crucial in how you ac access not just financial services, um, but how you access different products, right. maybe agricultural products, may maybe as an SME. Um, so the early days of the program, we're only three years old. Um, we've grown beyond um, our wildest dreams um, and these are kinds of the, the kinds and types of things that we're finding through the data through working with governments um, and through through keeping our finger on the ground in terms of consumers and what the consumers are telling us. Three years old and the problem is the problems obviously are still very big and lots to do. Let's talk about women uh, for a moment because we know that there are different economic vulnerabilities that will be gender specific. Uh, how should we be thinking about mainstreaming women uh, as we try and address uh, financial inclusion? What we uh, Interestingly enough, we've started to look at a lot of gender-specific data yes. around financial inclusion and women. Um, what we have found in countries like Malawi, Lesotho, Swaziland, um, countries with very large women-headed households. Um, they are central to the household, they manage household budgets, um, and they are key controllers of the household person, how, how, how the household functions. Um, what's also becoming quite prominent both in Asia and Africa is remittances mm. and money moving across borders through women working across borders which I have found particularly interesting. So women working in Thailand sending money home um, to countries like Laos, women working in South Africa and sending money home to Zimbabwe. So increasingly we're starting to look at what what is the role of development? Mm. What are the role of donors? And how do we start supporting the women in development um, and providing greater resilience mm. to women-headed households? Global initiatives take the lead when it comes to working with the poor, but local partners are essential. Africa Corporate Advisors has been the eyes and ears of the Finmark Trust and other development agencies in Africa, and in particular, in the Zimbabwean market. We are trade and investment advisors 
working to facilitate the work of uh, development um, agencies that are targeting Africa, in particular East and Southern Africa. With Finmark Trust, we are their local project coordinators in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. We've been working with them since 2011 to facilitate the implementation of uh, financial inclusion uh, initiatives. How important, how, how important are you to their programs? Uh, the other way of asking the questions would be, would they be able to achieve what they do without a local partner on the ground? They probably would not achieve the same level of success as they've uh, had so far, mm -hmm. particularly in Zimbabwe, because in any country they, that they work in, they need to get um, uh, someone with local knowledge and um, capacity mm. uh, to who relates well with the stakeholders, mm. particularly government and the financial sector players. And understanding, of course, that you have a, a fantastic relationship with them, but can you give a general um, assessment of how development organizations are doing on the ground in Africa when it comes to addressing financial inclusion? I think Finmark Trust is in the forefront um, of uh, financial inclusion in, in, in Africa. There are a number of other um, agencies, including the World Bank um, and various other organizations that are working in this uh, broad area. But Finmark Trust has been very helpful, particularly through the, the development of the FinScope tool, which is an analytical tool which helps um, to understand the financial sector, even uh, the SME sector, which has, and this has been used extensively uh, in Africa. Mm. And they, I believe they've also taken it to Asia. So that has given them the, the edge uh, uh, where they can work with any other development agents mm. to promote financial inclusion. Give us a sense of uh, the, the dynamics in Zimbabwe and in that particular economy. Uh, the number of uh, banked versus unbanked population, uh, how does that currently sit? Okay, when we executed the first FinScope survey with Finmark Trust in 2011, we were looking at um, banked population of about 24%. Mm -hmm. uh, this a repeat survey we did in 2014 showed that bank, uh, bank usage had grown to about 30%. Mm -hmm. right? However, there is also dynamics in the way the actual usage of the accounts by those uh, account holders has actually gone down. Mm. Yeah. So why has usage gone down? What does that tell us? I think it's um, um, because of the emergence of other um, means of uh, transacting, mm -hmm. particularly mobile money, right. as well as uh, um, challenges within the banking system itself. Um, which does not um, uh, allow them to provide a service without probably um, some, some basic charges, right. particularly account main maintenance fees are a sore point. Trust and credibility is a big theme when it comes to the, the, the financial services and products. And if we take a look at the Zimbabwean economy, there might be some challenges in that regard. How do you then ensure that uh, consumers trust the products okay. that come from the various stakeholders? Yeah. The trust issues were, are historical. Mm. You know, Zimbabwe went through a hyperinflationary period um, and then he, uh, replaced it with um, what we call a dollarized uh, economy. We call it a multi, uh, multi currency regime. Yes. And in the process, um, Zimbabwe dollar bank values were decimated to zero. Every, we started from zero. And that has created a lot of um, uh, hardships for many people who lost their life savings, particularly with. Uh, financial products, savings accounts went to zero, insurance policies went to zero, and uh, th that created a major, major issue with, uh, 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 with, with the depositors, particularly who lost their funds with the banks. But uh, with now Zimbabwe using the, the US dollar as the, the principal currency mm. uh, in the multi-currencies, uh, the confidence is creeping up. Mm -hmm. In fact, confidence in the banking system itself has gone up because a lot of the banks have uh, uh, gone by. So what, what are remaining are largely banks that have managed to withstand the transition from right. a, do, a, a Zim dollar environment to a dollarized economy. So confidence is coming up, particularly with um, some of the insurance products that are, that are based on a, um, a physical products rather than monetary values. Mm. And, and just uh, as a final question, a reflection on uh, the small and medium-sized enterprises in, uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, what, how would you describe their appetite uh, for, for financial inclusive uh, products? Um, would you say that there's, uh, there's a growing appetite for these products? It's actually massive. Yeah. Um, the Zimbabwean economy, um, after the, the vagaries we've spoken about, has now transformed significantly into a, an SME-driven economy. The challenges we are having at the moment with SMEs is that 
the majority of them, probably 60 to 70 percent, are informal in the sense that they are not registered. Mm. But they've ma they, their capacity to take on um, new product in, uh, uh, offerings is huge. Um, the word they use that uh, most of these are driven by youngsters or techno swave, as they say. Yes. Right. So they have a capacity to take on these new products. But in the process, that's where Finmark Trust comes in yes. to help um, formalize this process and make sure that there is um, sufficient reg uh, regulatory capacity to protect the public. And that's what Finmark Trust has been working with. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for making the time to join us. Now, do remember that if you want to be a part of the conversations from Invest Africa, all you need to do is drop us a tweet. The hashtag is Invest Africa. And of course, following me at The Real Nosy or at CNBC Africa. Let us know what you would like to see on the show. Until next time, it's goodbye.